there is the possibility for religion and science to forge a potent partnership against pseudoscience. Strangely, I think it would soon be engaged also in opposing pseudo-religion. Pseudoscience differs from erroneous science. Science thrives on errors, cutting them away one by one. False conclusions are drawn all the time, but they are drawn tentatively. Hypotheses are framed so they are capable of being disproved. A succession of alternative hypotheses is confronted by experiment and observation. Science gropes and staggers toward improved understanding. Proprietary feelings are of course offended when a scientific hypothesis is disproved, but such disproofs are recognized as central to the scientific enterprise. Pseudoscience is just the opposite. Hypotheses are often framed precisely so they are invulnerable to any experiment that offers a prospect of disproof, so even in principle they cannot be invalidated. Practitioners are defensive and wary. Skeptical scrutiny is opposed. When the pseudo-scientific hypothesis fails to catch fire with scientists, conspiracies to suppress it are deduced. We're good in some things, but not in everything. Wisdom lies in understanding our limitations. For man is a giddy thing, teaches William Shakespeare. That's where the stuffy, skeptical rigor of science comes in. Perhaps the sharpest distinction between science and pseudoscience is that science has a far keener appreciation of human imperfections and fallibility than does pseudoscience, or inerrant revelation. If we resolutely refuse to acknowledge where we are liable to fall into error, then we can confidently expect that error, even serious error, profound mistakes, will be our companion forever. But if we are capable of a little courageous self-assessment, whatever rueful reflections they may engender, our chances improve enormously. If we teach only the findings and products of science, no matter how useful and even inspiring they may be, without communicating its critical method, how can the average person possibly distinguish science from pseudoscience? Both, then, are presented as unsupported assertion. In Russia and China, it used to be easy. Authoritative science was what the authorities taught. The distinction between science and pseudoscience was made for you. No perplexities needed to be muddled through. But when profound political changes occurred and strictures on free thought were loosened, a host of confident or charismatic claims, especially those that told us what we wanted to hear, gained a vast following. Every notion, however improbable, became authoritative. It is a supreme challenge for the popularizer of science to make clear the actual tortuous history of its great discoveries and the misapprehensions and occasional stubborn refusal by its practitioners to change course. Many, perhaps most, science textbooks for budding scientists tread lightly here. It is enormously easier to present in an appealing way the wisdom distilled from centuries of patient and collective interrogation of nature than to detail the messy distillation apparatus. The method of science, as stodgy and grumpy as it may seem, is far more important than the findings of science. I was a child in a time of hope. I wanted to be a scientist from my earliest school days. A crystallizing moment came when I first caught on that the stars are mighty suns, when it first dawned on me how staggeringly far away they must be to appear as mere points of light in the sky. I'm not sure I even knew the meaning of the word science then, but I wanted somehow to immerse myself in all that grandeur. I was gripped by the splendor of the universe, transfixed by the prospect of understanding how things really worked, of helping to uncover deep mysteries, of exploring new worlds, maybe even literally. It has been my good fortune to have had that dream in part fulfilled. For me, the romance of science remains as appealing and new as it was on that day, more than half a century ago, when I was shown the wonders of the 1939 World's Fair. Popularizing science, trying to make its methods and findings accessible to non-scientists, then follows naturally and immediately. Not explaining science seems to me perverse. When you're in love, you want to tell the world. This book is a personal statement reflecting my lifelong love affair with science. But there's another reason. Science is more than a body of knowledge. It is a way of thinking. I have a foreboding of an America in my children's or grandchildren's time when the United States is a service and information economy, when nearly all the key manufacturing industries have slipped away to other countries, when awesome technological powers are in the hands of a very few, and no one representing the public interest can even grasp the issues when the people have lost the ability to set their own agendas or knowledgeably question those in authority, when, clutching our crystals and nervously consulting our horoscopes, our critical faculties in decline, unable to distinguish between what feels good and what's true, we slide, almost without noticing, back into superstition and darkness. 
The dumbing down of America is most evident in the slow decay of substantive content in the enormously influential media. The 30-second sound bites, now down to 10 seconds or less, lowest common denominator programming, credulous presentations on pseudoscience and superstition, but especially a kind of celebration of ignorance. As I write, the number one video cassette rental in America is the movie Dumb and Dumber. Beavis and Butthead remain popular and influential with young TV viewers. The plain lesson is that study and learning, not just of science but of anything, are avoidable, even undesirable. We've arranged a global civilization in which most crucial elements, transportation, communications and all other industries, agriculture, medicine, education, entertainment, protecting the environment, and even the key democratic institution of voting, profoundly depend on science and technology. We have also arranged things so that almost no one understands science and technology. This is a prescription for disaster. We might get away with it for a while, but sooner or later this combustible mixture of ignorance and power is going to blow up in our faces. A Candle in the Dark is the title of a courageous, largely biblically based book by Thomas Aidy, published in London in 1656, attacking the witch hunts then in progress as a scam to delude the people. Any illness or storm, anything out of the ordinary, was popularly attributed to witchcraft. Witches must exist, A.D. quoted the witchmongers as arguing, else how should these things be or come to pass? For much of our history, we were so fearful of the outside world with its unpredictable dangers that we gladly embraced anything that promised to soften or explain away the terror. Science is an attempt, largely successful, to understand the world, to get a grip on things, to get hold of ourselves, to steer a safe course. Microbiology and meteorology now explain what only a few centuries ago was considered sufficient cause to burn women to death. Aidy also warned of the danger that the nations will perish for lack of knowledge. Avoidable human misery is more often caused not so much by stupidity as by ignorance, particularly our ignorance about ourselves. I worry that, especially as the millennium edges nearer, pseudoscience and superstition will seem year by year more tempting, the siren song of unreason more sonorous and attractive. Where have we heard it before? Whenever our ethnic or national prejudices are aroused, in times of scarcity, during challenges to national self-esteem or nerve, when we agonize about our diminished cosmic place and purpose, or when fanaticism is bubbling up around us, then habits of thought familiar from ages past reach for the controls. The candle flame gutters, its little pool of light trembles, darkness gathers, the demons begin to stir. There is much that science doesn't understand, many mysteries still to be resolved. In a universe tens of billions of light years across and some 10 or 15 billion years old, this may be the case forever. We are constantly stumbling on surprises, Yet some New Age and religious writers assert that scientists believe that what they find is all there is. Scientists may reject mystic revelations for which there is no evidence except somebody say so, but they hardly believe their knowledge of nature to be complete. Science is far from a perfect instrument of knowledge. It's just the best we have. In this respect, as in many others, it's like democracy. Science by itself cannot advocate courses of human action but it can certainly illuminate the possible consequences of alternative courses of action. The scientific way of thinking is at once imaginative and disciplined. This is central to its success. Science invites us to let the facts in, even when they don't conform to our preconceptions. It counsels us to carry alternative hypotheses in our heads and see which best fit the facts. It urges on us a delicate balance between no-holds-barred openness to new ideas, however heretical, and the most rigorous sceptical scrutiny of everything new ideas and established wisdom. This kind of thinking is also an essential tool for a democracy in an age of change. One of the reasons for its success is that science has built in error-correcting machinery at its very heart. Some may consider this an overbroad characterization, but to me, every time we exercise self-criticism, every time we test our ideas against the outside world, we are doing science. When we are self-indulgent and uncritical, when we confuse hopes and facts, we slide into pseudoscience and superstition. Scientists are usually careful to characterize the veridical status of their attempts to understand the world, ranging from conjectures and hypotheses, which are highly tentative, all the way up to laws of nature which are repeatedly and systematically confirmed through many interrogations of how the world works. But even laws of nature are not absolutely certain. There may be new circumstances never before examined, 
inside black holes, say, or within the electron, or close to the speed of light. 